Thank you all for inviting me to talk to you today. My name is Anastasia Danilova. I'm a medical oncologist at Moscow City Oncology Hospital number 62. We are a large comprehensive cancer center, even though we're just a county uh, hospital in Moscow. And uh, I do have one disclosure. I'm a practicing oncologist, and I talk to patients every single day. I'm sorry, this is going forward. No, there. Yeah, and there it is. And I have to disappoint you. I'm not going to teach you communication today. I don't have the training for it, and it can't possibly be taught in 20 minutes that I have. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to talk to you about the importance of effective clinical communications in medical, in medical care and the tools and frameworks uh, and resources that can be used to help you do it every day. So we've all been there. You're a physician, you're always in a rush, you have patients to see, forms to fill out, research to do, and we've all had these terrible, horrible, unengaged, unmeaningful, short conversations with patients. And conversations like that help no one. It doesn't help the patient, it doesn't help you because you feel very bad afterwards. Because, and um, we have to remember that medicine is not only about giving the right diagnosis, or finding the right treatment, or even being able to do a very, very um, difficult surgery. The center of all of our efforts, the center, the cornerstone of all of our physician skills and knowledge is the patient. And without the patient, we, we, we can't achieve anything. So um, today, I want to talk to you about the central importance of effective clinical care, effective clinical communication, and how it can lead to high quality health care. And we have to understand that communication is the final common pathway of every decision and every aspect of medical care. What we've been taught in medical school, at least what I've been taught in medical school, is what is so known as the uh, traditional approach to uh, clinical communication, or is, is, it's also known as the physician-centered approach, where the goal is to diagnose the disease. Every clinical encounter follows the doctor's agenda. The doctor decides what to ask, when to stop, what to do. It's the, a patriarchal approach. The doctor knows best what's, what's the best for the patient. A consent is sometimes um, skipped. You know, it's patients there, patients autonomy it equals consent. And only simplistic reassurance techniques are used as support techniques. And we know now that this is not enough. So researchers and physicians are moving towards a what is now called the patient-centered approach, where actually the patient is in the center of everything that we do. The goal is still to diagnose the, the, the disease, but it also is for the patient to understand the illness. It's not about the doctor's agenda, but it's about the patient's agenda their perception of the illness, of, of their, their expectations of what's going to happen. We have to address their concerns and listen to them. It's patients' participation and encouragement of that per participation and encourage shared decision making. We have to acknowledge and respect the patient's choices. And yes, they do sometimes guide our clinical decisions. Not guide, but help or you know, tailor in some way. And we have to know that this, we have to try for the support to be tailored to what the patient actually needs and not only to what we know or what we do. So why did we actually move to a, an approach like that? And why is an approach like that so important for the clinician? <laughs> Maybe it's making the consultation really long, right? No, it's not. Multiple works have shown that effective communication skills actually make, effect, make interviews and consults more effective. They increase diagnosis accuracy, they increase efficiency, they ensure informed consent, and actually improve patient satisfaction. Less negative feedback, less, per, less uh, malpractice suits. They make the partner, uh, an actual, they make the patient an actual partner in the whole treatment process, and thus increase compliance to treatment by the patient. They actually improve health outcome in patients, yes they do. And patients and uh, clinical trials have bad or cruel if the patient is well informed and if the communication is good. And as we all know, a clinical trial is always the best idea for a patient, especially in oncology. Oh, wait. Um, it reduces burnout, 
under diminished resources. And this is, is especially true for doctors in middle and low income countries where we have so much stuff to do and so little time and the system is kind of working against us. It does reduce burnout. And it increases doctors' competence in discussing complex subjects. So we become better professionals and we actually become professionals. Why is it so important for the patient? Have you ever been a patient? I've been a patient multiple times. And if someone talks to me and actually communicates to me, it reduces your fear and anxiety through, de through a development of trust and confidence. If I trust my doctor, I'm going to have a better conversation with him and my treatment is going to go better. It does assist in sorting out complex information. Some treatments and diagnoses are very complex and it's, not, and it's the effective communications that help us as patients understand it. It reduces uncertainty by having a plan. When you know that your doctor has a plan for everything, no matter the good, the bad, the news, they all are always going to have a plan. And that uncertainty is reduced that way. It enhances sense of control when options and choices are discussed. You're not only given one option, you have to have surgery. You discuss all of your options. And it's kind of like you're, a, you're an actual partner in the decision-making process. And it's, it's great for the patient. It, I'm sorry. They're moving faster than I am. Uh, it allows the patients to discuss their concerns. And it promotes psycho psychological adjustment, especially in uh, oncology, where your treatment is a journey and your disease is a journey. We have to understand that you're not born a good communicator. Communication skills are not innate abilities. They should be taught and learned and used in an attentive manner. And it, it's not about being an extrovert or an introvert. It's not about smiling or being nice. Um, and actually, people who think they're good communicators receive less ratings from uh, communication skill pay, pay, from, from patients on uh, communication skills. So it's not something you're born with. You have to learn it. It's a skill, much like learning to do surgery. And it is an important and essential skill of being a medical professional. So um, these are the core skills that are um, that should be learned and should be used in a clinical encounter. And as you can see, most of those skills are actually active listening. It's not about talking or telling. It's effective listening and open history taking. It's picking up cues. The patient throughout an encounter, he gives you hints on what he wants to talk to you about. It may be nonverbal. It may be you know, a word he kind of interrupts you. And if you wait until the end of the conversation for him to ask questions, he's going to lose the hint and he's not going to ask you a very important question. It's effective nonverbal communication. A doctor who is writing or, you know, um, writing something on his computer and not, not looking at the patient, or a doctor who is very far away or, you know, divided, to the f through the, uh, divided from the patient by a big table, um, it's not effective, it won't help you uh, in your communication. It's demonstrating empathy, being empathic, and understanding or trying to understand what is the patient is going through is also essential. It's lack of an appropriate jargon. It's not only about using very difficult and long terms, who I personally can't pronounce all of them, but it's about using the right words at the right time. It's about giving basic information about the procedure that the patient is about, is about to go through. And it's always empowering the patient to ask questions because they do have questions and then they will have more questions and they should ask them. So um, this is a, what is now widely used, a Calgary-Cambridge model of communication. I'm telling you, I'm not an expert at this. I didn't have specific training. Um, but I'll try to tell you how to incorporate it into your uh, daily practice. So the model d d divides the encounter into several different steps. It's initiating the session, gathering information, physical examination, probably all of us know how to do that, hopefully, um, explanation and planning, and then clothing, clothing, closing the session. And throughout this whole process, we're building a relationship with, uh, with the patient, and we're providing structure. So in the next couple of slides, sorry, no, no, no. In the next couple of slides, I'll try to discuss in a little further detail some of these aspects. Not in a whole lot of detail because I only have so much, so much, so little time, and, but in some detail. So the first part of every medical encounter is initiating the session. The patient comes in, or you come into the patient. You come in and you greet the patient. You obtain the patient's name, and then you introduce yourself. 
The patient doesn't know what's, who, what's your name, and sometimes they don't know the pronunciation or how the long name, and they're afraid to ask. So introduce yourself. Introduce your role in the patient's interview and obtain consent if it's necessary. Demonstrate respect and interest. Don't look or act uninterested like you know everything. You've, saw, you've seen the CT scans. You know everything. At, at, show interest. And, sorry. Sorry. No, why is it? I don't know why it's jumping. Um, and attend to the patient's physical comfort. If it's too cold, if the patient feels, I don't know, if he's uncovered or if the, the chair is uncomfortable, make sure he's comfortable because you have a long journey with this patient. Even if it's one conversation, you still have to make sure he's comfortable. Then the next step is identifying the reasons for the consultation. And there you have to ask the patient not a whole bunch of questions, but just one question. What brought this patient to you? What are his needs, what are the, um, his uh, concerns, and what brought him to this, the, this hospital. And then you listen attentively and listen to the patient's opening statement. It may have nothing to do with what you're going to go after. It may have nothing to do with uh, the disease or the diagnosis, but it's important because this is what brought him to your hospital. Not something else, but this. Um, if he lists some some symptoms, then you have to screen and ask for some more. Encourage him to, to tell you more symptoms, you know. Listen attentively again and confirm the patient the symptoms that you hear and screen for some more. And then negotiate the agenda. Tell, him, tell, tell the patient what you want from your conversation, what you want to hear and you, what you want to do and what's your point of being here. Um, again, that's the part of active listening, not more talking from you. And this part, again, not more and not that much talking from you. Encourage the patient to tell their story. When it started, how it's, go how it's, how, how it's going, in their own words. You, put in, you use open and closed questions. There are lots of techniques you can use. Again, listen attentively. Don't think that you know everything if you've seen the CT scan. Don't think you know everything if you've seen the histology. Listen to the patient. Let them talk. Let them explain. Um, facilitate the patient's responses. Make sure you use, you use nonverbal non techniques. Nod or ask questions or do whatever you need to do to make sh so the patient knows that you're engaged in this conversation. P again, pick up verbal and nonverbal uh, uh, clues. Um, if you need something explained or clarified, ask. What do you mean by when you say lightheaded? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask, or don't think that you know what he means by lightheaded. Um, periodically summarize what you've heard for, uh, from the patient to make sure you both are on the same page. When you ask questions, be concise and use um, easily understood forms of questions in easily understood words. Then you have to establish what's going to come next for the patient, the sequence and dates of what's coming next. This is the first part of a medical encounter where you're doing the talking, but don't give out too much information at one time. Use uh, a what's, what's called chunks and checks. Give some information, basic language, and then check if the patient understood it. Check if you both are on the same page. Assess the patient starting, and this is the time to ask, what do you want? To, what do you actually want to know about your diagnosis, about your treatment plan? Assess what has he known so far? What does he want to know and to what extent? You know, some, some patients, uh, not all patients want to know everything, and not all patients want to be, uh, want to use shared decision making, want to use a shared decision making approach. So talk to the patient, ask him what he wants to know and how he wants to know, and give explanations to the questions and to the needs he have. Um, so the next step is, so these are basically the uh, explanation and planning. You're explaining and you're planning the next steps. Uh, and the last part of a medical, ah, sorry. So the last part of a medical encounter is the closing session. This is, this is where you repeat the next steps for both the physician and the patient. Make sure you're both on the same page. Make sure he knows what the next steps are. Make sure you both know what the next steps are. And they're actually the same. This is the time when to discuss um, the negative outcomes and the unpredicted outcomes for the patient. What to do if? What if the plan that you um, thought of is going to go wrong? What to do next? Who to contact? Where to seek help? 
Um, summarize this session briefly and clarify the plan of care. Make sure the patient understands the plan of care. And then, and not the least, the last but not the least, check with the patient. Does he actually agree to the plan? I mean, you've done that in the previous parts, but again, make sure that the patient is comfortable with the plan that you chose. And if he has any corrections, or she or they have any corrections, make sure you do them or make sure you point that out. And if he has questions to discuss, encourage to ask questions again. Are there any more questions? What can I do? What can I, how can I help you? Is there anything else you want to discuss? So um, I have to tell you that medical communication, the way it's supposed to be, is not taught in Russia. It's not taught in medical schools in Russia. It's not taught in residency programs. And it's not a part of some postgraduate training that doctors have to go through. And uh, most physicians in Russia don't know how to talk to patients. They do it you know, kind of uh, intuitively. They think that what they think is right is right. Some of them. Uh, who think that being nice is being a good doctor or smiling is being a good doctor and that's the key to good communication. But actually learning it is what you have to do and it's a very important for you to become a medical professional. I don't know about the um, uh, courses on clinical communication that are available at uh, medical schools right now. Maybe some of them are just happening or you know just starting. But there are two uh, commercially available clinical courses on, uh, on um, courses on clinical communication. I'm not here to advertise anything, but I'm just saying that this, these are the two that I know of. One is uh, Sabshenia Medical Communication Skill Course by Anna Sonkina Dorman, and the other one is by Maxim Kor who was actually working with Anna Sonkina Dorman and it's part of the higher school of um, oncology curriculum and they offer it to maybe I think hospitals and you can kind of buy a course and no I don't know well that's what I that's what I thought saw on their website please correct me if I'm wrong and if you know of any others please share them those are the two I know of there are lots of excellent online and offline resources ASCO offers lots of uh, sharing bad prognosis uh, the all the protocol spikes nurse uh, tons of tons of uh, acronyms of protocols that you can use in your daily practice but don't think that you're a good communicator because most of us are not I'm not none of us are not not yet uh, because we haven't had any training and we haven't been uh, taught or you know tested on it so please use every learning opportunity you have offline online or whatever to make sure that you actually learn something new and um, you know, think about it when you see patients. Uh, and what I wanted to, I don't have a conclusion for this talk because this was actually a preface, an introduction to whatever this is. But I have to say that this, it will be okay. You will get it wrong at times. You will disappoint your patients. And, but sometimes you will get it right. Sometimes you will actually satisfy your patients and be satisfied. And it takes practice and lots of practice. Even if you learn something, it takes everyday practice. And remember that every clinical encounter makes you a different, a different doctor. And if you remember the faces, the stories, and your mistakes, and you actually reflect on those mistakes, then you will work better and try to become a better doctor. So thank you so much for your time. And feel free to contact me or reach out. Question? Remarks, question, comments. Yeah, since, since I have the mic, <laughs> thank you very much for your ex a very emphatic uh, presentation. Um, I, I've been teaching uh, this module for for residents in Russia for four years now, and uh, usually it's uh, like a one um, live session when I come to to Russia. And uh, every week we try to incorporate in our um, kind of uh, weekly discussion some part of the communication. And what I, I'm not very satisfied with what the outcome is. I, I think um, uh, the problem, I think, is that the skill diminishes very quickly without any environment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easy for me to practice the, the communication skills because everyone around me practices it, it's just impossible. Here, um, um, I don't think that staff has the, uh, um, the skills and knowledge about that. And uh, I'm uh, kind of desperate at times. What do you think uh, the, um, uh, the solution would be? Well, um, 
my sister, I'm going to tell you a secret. My sister is a journalist, and uh, she just participated in the uh, Anna Sunken Adorman course as a journalist uh, trying to uh, write a story about uh, empathy teaching for doctors in, in Russia. But that's, um, and what she told me is that, um, and actually I know that from other sources too, that if it's being, you know, brought on from, from the, from the st hospital staff onto the doctor and they're required to do a course. They're going to go sit through it, maybe do a test, but they're never going to use it or practice it because they don't know why they need. And it's very hard to convince a doctor, especially an established doctor or a professor or someone who's great at everything else, that he has to go through a training, through training like that. And he actually have to, has to follow steps and uh, hear feedback which is going to be mostly negative at first. So it's very, very difficult to incorporate it into a daily practice, especially where it's never been taught before. And people think that they're smarter than everyone else. Because, I mean, that's, that's what people think. And a lot of us think that way. So what I think it can be done is going from the young, so the young oncologist trying to um, make your microenvironment by yourself, trying to um, circle yourself with other mindful, attentive, thinking, uh, ambitious young oncologists who want to do the same, who you can practice with, train with, share your feedback with, and do that because the system's not going to help you. And you can find a gazillion reasons not to do it because it's not going to work. No one's going to buy it. People in Russia don't want shared decision making. People in Russia do blah, 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 and lots of cultural stereotypes. But you have to start. And where to start from? Bring a friend. Do something. Find a colleague who's interested. Make him interested. And build your microenvironment, and maybe that's going to change things somehow. I don't see other options. Great. <laughs> I have a question yet back there. Is there any difference between communicating with the patient and with the patient's relatives? Because there's a common, uh, especially from the South, for instance, of Russia, when they come like with the patient and uh, her husband, her mother, her sister, and they, even they then, uh, they don't let the patient speak. They speak uh, for themselves because they think they, sh uh, they know what's the best for the patient. And the patient will be just like, sitting and speaking nothing. And it's actually a problem for, uh, especially for a young oncologist, to make the patient speak, to ask uh, what you want to do if you agree, but they just sit there and let the, uh, the relatives speak for themselves. Is there any difference uh, between the communication with the patient well, and the relatives? Uh, thank you for your question. And it is actually a big problem, I'm sure, not only in southern regions of Russia, but the whole um, cultural, there are different cultural aspects of patient, doctor, patient, physician, patient communications um, all around the world. And you do have to take it into consideration. And um, I'm sure incorporating shared decision making and uh, effective communication is a lot harder, especially where it's a patriarchal family or where, you know, I don't know, the father, the husband, the mother, or whoever is the leader of the family thinks they're making all the decisions. But it's very important maybe to isolate the patient at the beginning. Um, not isolate as say things, please go uh, in a different room, but actually finding something to do for the relative. Please fill out some notes or please check something for me. Make them feel uh, important and needed. And then you're going to have some time to actually talk to the patient. I don't have any specific uh, recipes for you or specific answers for you, but um, I'm sure you should um, research it, and I'm sure you should try to uh, practice it. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a question to our international colleagues. What about system in Switzerland and Italy and Greece? Do you have any kind of training in patient so uh, I, uh, I'm Maria Del Grande, I'm working in Switzerland, and uh, I can add that uh, really in Switzerland uh, uh, only 15 years, uh, close to 15 years, uh, that exists uh, this uh, type of education incorporated on the oncology training. And uh, that's true uh, in that moment uh, when the uh, state system decided, okay, we should, uh, we have to incorporate it, uh, many professors 
have to pass through uh, this type of uh, education. And it was a surprise for them to find out uh, something new. But at the end, uh, everyone find, uh, found out uh, uh, the advantage of this education. I can add that there are different uh, cultural um, particularities. Because uh, as you are speaking from American point of view, it's not the same, for example, in south part of Switzerland or in north part of Switzerland. So this type of education should be really uh, adapted on the uh, cultural uh, where it works, where it should be applied. Because you can't pass through American system and apply it in uh, Russian. It will not work. Uh, the phrases you, you are using, the, uh, the type of communication, because uh, uh, very often the patients, for example, in the US, as I had seen, and I will uh, speak about it, they much more informed than Russian patients. So there are uh, diff uh, many differences. Uh, if we can give the Italian perspective. We don't have actually a real training on communication and will be actually important to have, especially for the young generation. And, uh, but I'm going back to the comment of Maria that uh, there are a lot of cultural differences between the different countries. So I'm, I don't know how much maybe European society can do this training program. I've been working some, for some time in the US and also in the north of Europe. There the communication is much different as compared to what we do in Italy and particularly in the southern part of Italy, in which the type of information we share is, uh, I will say, a bit less than in other type of countries. But I do believe that we, we, we will need some training, especially during on the oncology training. So during our specialty, I think this is something that we should be trained about, because it's, as a medical oncologist, this is what we do almost 80% of our time. So it's something that I, I, I do believe we need some training. Yes, but um, I think that if we try to invent something for every cultural background or for every cultural environment, especially where you have nothing to invent it from, it's going to take us ages to implement it, and we're never going to move anywhere from, from where we are now. So the maybe easier way is to implement something, test the theory, and then adapt it to the environment that you're actually uh, doing it in. Can I ask a different question? What is the situation in Russia about telling the truth to the patient? Um, by law, uh, it's required to tell the patient of his or her diagnosis. Um, so all the medical documentation that is given to a patient is states the diagnosis, the stage, and everything. The problem is that um, all the medical notes are, are written in a language that most patients can't uh, understand. So when they see a note from the doctor where it says um, non-small cell lung cancer, stage four metastasis to the blah, 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 they have no idea what it is because no one discussed anything with them. So even if they know the diagnosis, the diagnosis they don't un always understand the extent, the, uh, the survival data. Uh, they don't have a plan of, what, of you know, how long they have with this diagnosis. So it's not really about hearing the diagnosis, yes, doctors share di the diagnosis with patients now. But we have to make sure that our patients understand what's happening to them, understand their diagnosis, so they can make plans, because everyone, to make, everyone wants, to make, want to make, uh, wants to make plans for the future. So we want to make sure that patients in Russia are better informed. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. They are informed, but they're not informed enough. And we have to do our best and we have to do a better job in informing our patients. So in other words, you are in favor of telling your patient both diagnosis and prognosis? We have to tell the patients exactly the amount of information they are ready and they want to hear from us. Not more and not less. And it may be, it is maybe as a different amount of information at different parts of their uh, treatment journey. And you have to come back to discussing the prognosis and plans and whatever at different times of, um, of their life or at different times of their treatment or at different times, you know, just times. Because it's not always you want to hear everything from the beginning, but maybe uh, during your journey you're going to want to know more. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>